think I have. You're in Alderet. Wow. The miracles of modern science. One minute in London, the next minute in Eldoret, the next minute in Portugal, the next minute in... Okay. Um, I'm again getting a um, flashing on my screen saying my internet connection is unstable. So if, uh, if my voice goes shaky, then please let me know and I'll just go on to audio. Okay, all right then. I think Dr. Mungo is having challenges, so I will do the Mangla Charan. Okay. Um, Om Agnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshuru Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vedamaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvitam Sabadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sadhana Lalita Shri Vishakalitam Shri Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagat Pati Kopesha Kopika Kanta Radha Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Rishabhanu Sute Devi Ranamami Vanchaka Pataru Vyascha Pika Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Vasadi Gaurapatta Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, thank you very much for joining today and making yourself available to us again this week. Um, we've, uh, uh, Bhakta Mugo, we have finished uh, 36 yesterday, isn't it? Yes, yes, Hare Krishna. Yes, Hare we finished 36 yesterday. So we are on Kanda chapter 9, and the text for today is 37, Prabhuji. I know I said 36, but uh, if if you want, we can discuss 36 as well. And no, you, then... told me 30, you told me 37 oh. earlier on. Yeah, oh. that's fine. Oh. Hare Krishna, um, over to you, Prabhuji. Thank you Jai. for joining. Jai. So I, I, I'm the first one to talk on 37, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, Answer by citing the Lord's version continuation of Canto 2, Chapter 9. Now we're on text 37. Eitan matam samatishta panamena samadina bhavan kalpa vikalpeshu navimu yatikarhichit. Translation. O oh, Brahma, just follow this conclusion by fixed concentration of mind, and no pride will disturb you, neither in the partial nor in the final devastation. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. As in the Bhagavad Gita 10th chapter, the personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, has summarized the whole text in four verses, namely Aham Sarvasya Prabhava, etc., so the complete Srimad Bhagavatam has also been summarized in four verses as Aham, Evasyam, Evagre, etc. Thus, the secret purpose of the most important Bhagavatite conclusion 
has been explained by the original speaker of the Srimad Bhagavatam, who was also the original speaker of the Bhagavad Gita, personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna. There are many grammarians and non-devotee material wranglers who have tried to prevent false interpretation of these four verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam, present false interpretation of these four verses of Srimad Bhagavatam. But the Lord himself advised Brahmaji not to be deviated from the fixed conclusion the Lord had taught him. The Lord was the teacher of the nucleus of Srimad Bhagavatam in four verses, and Brahma was the receiver of the knowledge. Misinterpretation of the word aham by the word jugglery of the impersonalist should not disturb the mind of the strict followers of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is the text of the personality of Godhead and his unalloyed devotees, who are also known as Bhagavats. And any outsider should have no access to this confidential literature of devotional service. So I think um, we'll just uh, start from there and then we can continue with the purport as, as the mood arises. So this is, um, of course, the, the, the next verse after the Chatur Shlok. And um, Lord Krishna is confirming to Brahma that uh, he shouldn't be deviated. He shouldn't get on the mental platform and think that uh, the Bhagavatam means this or the Bhagavatam means that or just make up his own interpretation. He should be fixed by the concentration of the mind. And an important point is here, Krishna is saying, no pride will disturb you, neither in the partial nor in the final devastation. In other words, this knowledge that Krishna has just given to Brahmaji, this knowledge is going to last forever. It's not like it's, uh, it's the kind of knowledge that is current today or being some kind of a fashion, and then tomorrow it will be extinct. No, this knowledge will last forever. The, the, the partial devastation occurs at the end of Brahma's day and the final devastation at the end of Brahma's life. But this will go on forever. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the, the transcendental sound vibration of the Supreme Personality of Godhead discussing us all his pastimes. And Prabhupada says in, in the Bhagavad Gita explaining about how the four verses were described in the uh, in the chapter shlok and then these are referring also to the four verses described in bhagavad gita the conclusive verse which is 10 8 to 10 11 from what i can recall so thus the secret purpose of the most important bhagavad conclusion has been explained by the original speaker of the shima bhagavatam so how how can it be described as a secret we sell Bhagavad Gita and we sell Srimad Bhagavatam all over the world, millions of them. I think the last figure I heard from um, Madan Gopal Prabhu uh, when he was here a few days ago was that uh, the latest number of uh, books distributed worldwide is something like 600 million. And uh, they all contain the, 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 uh, these uh, so-called... Uh, secret or um, these um, by the original speaker that uh, the secret purpose of the most important conclusion has been explained by the original speaker of Bhagavatam. So what's secret about it? Like in uh, one chapter of Bhagavad Gita is called the most confidential knowledge. It's confidential, it's secret in a sense that uh, it can only be understood by the devotee. The impersonalists, the Mayavadi, the atheists, they cannot understand this message. Although the message is available to all, they cannot understand because it just goes past them completely and totally. Even those who are students of the Vedas, they just miss the whole point of the Vedas. They miss the whole point of Krishna's words in Bhagavad Gita. As Prabhupada is pointing out here, um, where was it? We shouldn't, the misinterpreta misinterpretation of the word aham by the word jugglery of the impersonalist should not disturb the mind of the strict followers of Srimad Bhagavatam. So there's an emphasis on the word strict here. And you have to be strict. 
because uh, let's face it, I mean, we, we, we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, pour, um, pour uh, you know, any disdain on anybody. But at the same time, we have to say that the, uh, the major theaters, the major places of pilgrimage in India today, they are governed by the impersonalists. They are governed by the Shankarites, and that's just a fact. Of course, um, uh, Srila Prabhupada and his advent and his mission and his philosophy and uh, his worldwide uh, his worldwide success in spreading the glories of the message of Mahaprabhu, they are beginning to make inroads. But the fact remains is. The, uh, the big, big sannyasis in charge of these tirtas, they're all Shankarites. And uh, Shankarites, they tend to be impersonalists. Of course, they, 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 the deities are there in all these places of pilgrimage, but the deity is considered to be something that you worship to the point where you reach perfection, you, you reach a point of moksha, and then you no longer lead the deity. Whereas we have a completely different understanding, as Prabhupada is saying here, misinterpretation of the word aham by the word juggling of the impersonal should not disturb the mind of the strict followers of Srimad Bhagavatam. So we must say that uh, these these uh, big, big, big places of pilgrimage where the, the Mayavadis are in charge, they are not strict followers of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is the text of the personality of Godhead and is unalloyed devotees. Unalloyed means no mixture. There's no mixture that it's this or it's that or it might be this or it might be that, speculating as to what it might be or what it, like, um, who was it? Wasn't it Ramakrishna? Prabhupada always quotes Ramakrishna. Of course, you, you can't say these things in the public because uh, recently one of our devotees got into trouble for giving this kind of lecture in Bengal, the, the home birthplace of Ramakrishna, the Ramakrishna mission. And uh, he was criticizing their understanding and their, their interpretation. Prabhupada was also very careful. He said, you don't criticize the person directly, but you examine his or her philosophy, and then you take that apart. And if his or her philosophy stands up to the test of the uh, Guru, Shastra and Sadhu, then of course we can accept it. But the, the impersonalists, they tend to say that Krishna doesn't mean a person and the, it, it is the I within Krishna. The I within Krishna. The, what is the I within Krishna? The I when Krishna says Aham, he's referring to himself as a person. He's not referring to anything else. So. This idea that uh, you know we all merge into the oneness of the absolute, this is not accepted. This misinterpretation, as Prabhupada is saying here, should not disturb the minds of the strict followers of Srimad Bhagavatam. And let's face it, the impersonists are in the majority. We're slowly, slowly, slowly getting inroads into chipping away at that impersonalist structure. But it's like granite, it's like a rock. To get past that, and Lord Chaitanya, he had the same, he had the same problem when, when he was manifesting his leelas. The biggest uh, opponents of Lord Chaitanya were the impersonalist uh, Brahmins. And they gave, they gave Lord Chaitanya nothing but difficulty in his mission. So to the point where they, uh, they went to the, they're the ones who went to the Chan Kazi. They're the ones who complained about Lord Chaitanya to the Muslim ruler. They used the, the power of the state. Uh, that was the ruler. The Muslims were in charge. The Mughal Empire was prominent at the time. So they went to the state to suppress the real religion. And that goes on from since time immemorial that has been going on. Since the time of uh, Hiranyakashipu, since the time of Ravan, the, the power of the state comes down against the, uh, the personalist philosophy, the, the idea that uh, Krishna is too Bhagavan Swayam. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to know that. We deny it. And if you look at the, uh, at the Abrahamic religions, at best, it's impersonal. At best. In fact, even in some of the Abrahamic religions, if you begin to describe God as a person, then as far as they're concerned, you should be put to death. It's got to that stage. 
so we're 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 up against a, a big obstacle here so krishna is uh, impressing upon brahma that uh, just follow this conclusion so that's the conclusion bhakti siddhanta the conclusion the final discourse the final interpretation of what is the whole Srimad bhagavatam and by fixed concentration of mind no pride will disturb you why is, why is krishna talking about pride because the pride that we think we know better we think we know better than shastra we think we know better than guru that's that's the problem and we want to speculate we want to interpret no it means this it means that everywhere Prabhupada went particularly in the west also also in india he was attacked with this impersonalist approach to the absolute truth people would stand up in audiences particularly in, in places like amsterdam and london new york and los angeles i am god they would declare i am god Prabhupada would get so angry he got so angry with his own disciples in the early days in 1971 72 when the prominent sannyasis in the movement declared one day that uh, no we've been very offensive Prabhupada is actually god and we should we we should reassess our worship of Srila Prabhupada and treat him as god when Prabhupada heard this he disbanded the gbc and he sent all those sannyasi removed them from all their positions so it's not that we're we're uh, uh, immune to this kind of impersonalist approach everybody wants to be a you know a, 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 the picture of perfection and as far as the impersonalists go the picture of perfection is that ultimately you become god so temporarily we're just acting out the role of being in maya so god is acting out the role of being in maya i mean it's 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 obviously nonsense it's nonsense to to our ears but here is krishna Krishna emphasizing this idea that you should concentrate your mind and be fixed. Don't allow pride of any kind to interfere with the ultimate message. And you, you will be safe. So in the Chatur Shloka, which we have just, the, the, the Chatur Shloka are also there in, the, in, in, in Bhagavad Gita, then uh, there's, a, there's a whole different in, interpretation for the for the chatter shloka in bhagavad gita like for instance in the um <clears throat> aham sarvasya prabhavo mata sarvam pravarta te these these are the four verses of the gita that uh, Prabhupada is referring to here in the purport today and uh, they give the the complete and total absolutely all comprehensive aspect of the absolute the all permeating aspect of the absolute and the personal aspect of the absolute is the personal aspect of the absolute that is so crucial that is absolutely essential and if we don't uh, if we don't understand the Sup bhagavan the supreme lord is defined as he who is inseparably replete with the six inconceivable qualities of wealth power fame beauty knowledge and renunciation that is described in the vishnu purana and uh, if we don't understand that that Krishna has all of these qualities. Nobody else has all of these qualities in total. As Prabhupada has described so many times, there may be some person who is very wealthy, some person who is very powerful, some person is very famous, some person is very beautiful, some person is very intelligent, full of knowledge, and somebody who is renounced. But nobody, nobody in the history of, of mankind, nobody has encapsulated or embraced all of these qualities simultaneously to the fullest extent except lord krishna so the characteristic of bhagavan as lord narayan is that all kinds of potencies are personally controlled by him even the potencies that are there within us they are controlled by krishna however in one uh, in one understanding which i read about recently uh, I was reading from a quote from Srila Jiva Goswami. He's given a special and a particularly fine interpretation. Bhagavan means, this is according to Jiva Goswami, Bhagavan means Bhajaniya Guna Vishishta. His nature is such that whoever comes in contact with him cannot resist serving him. That's the mood. We cannot, because what we always say it time and time and time again, we say, oh, uh, Krishna means all attractive but what does that actually mean Krishna means all attractive when you actually get into the the mood 
of understanding, even in the, the most infinitesimal realization, when you get into the mood of understanding just who Krishna is, nobody can resist. No one can resist the feeling, move to worship and adore his charming personality. Of course, these days now, we're all, um, we're all reading from and, and singing the Damodarastikam prayers. Who couldn't be attracted to singing the Damodarastikam prayers? And the whole mood and the whole leela of Krishna becoming subservient to his mother, Yashoda. I mean, it's such an attractive feature. Here's the Supreme Lord with all this majesty. We were reading the other day about um, the opulence of the absolute and the universal form and how Arjuna was completely overwhelmed in fear of this universal form till he begged Krishna, please, please go back to your, your two-armed form. He, he just couldn't handle it. So here is this universal majesty of Krishna being controlled by Mother Yashoda with a stick. This is personal. This, this is where it comes back, back to, to basics. So nobody can resist when you get a tiny glimpse of that, Krishna as a person, as the most attractive personality in existence, then as Lord Krishna, he attracts the love of everyone. Therefore, by the word of Savasya, Lord, the Lord Krishna indicates, I am Swayam Bhagavan, the Supreme Lord himself. I am the origin of not only Brahman, the all comprehensive aspect and Paramatma, the all permeating aspect, I'm also the origin of the master of all potency who commands the respect of everyone. So this is Lord Krishna. He commands everyone's respect. But it, it's not a one way thing. It's, it, it goes both ways. Just like Krishna commands everyone respect, he also respects us. He is more interested in coming to us than we are in coming to him. So in, uh, in, 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 there's a, one, a very nice quote from the uh, Kato Upanishad. It says, this is the quote, the Lord cannot be known by copious logic, intelligence, or deep study of scripture, but he reveals himself personally to the soul who having become eager to engage in his devotional service, prays to him for his mercy. So this is the secret. Pray to the Lord for his mercy. That's from the Kata Upanishad. And, 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 and it, it's, it's, it's obvious that for, for, for those of us who have, who have spent some years trying to understand a little bit about this philosophy, it, it doesn't work by logic, it doesn't work by intelligence. There are so many supremely intelligent devotees who have come and gone in, in this movement that we have all seen, we've all witnessed, really, really intelligent people and they've gone. So it's not by a deep study of the scriptures. There were so many devotees who could quote shlokas till the cows come home, but he reveals himself to the soul who has become eager to engage in his devotional service. This is the key. Service is the key. Matat sarvam pravartate. I am the first to reveal to the public. Worship me in this way. I appear as guru and through the guru, Krishna says, I worship myself. So it's, 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 it's through the Guru. The Guru is the manifestation right before our eyes of the representative of Krishna. He goes beyond even the representation of Krishna. The Guru, as we were discussing the other day, particularly in the case of uh, Prabhupada, the Guru is more merciful than Krishna himself. And Krishna is surrendered to the wish of his devotee. The bona fide spiritual master, you should know, Krishna says to Uddhava, as my very self, never dishonor him. The nature of Gurudev is that everything is godly and he should never be envied by ascribing one's mundane conception of place, time and circumstances upon him. That's from the 11th canto. And the Lord's finest potency is what? Let's start discussing this. His finest potency is Srimati Radharani. Of course, there are many other eternal associates, but what mood did Lord Chaitanya come in? And who are we followers of? We are followers of Lord Chaitanya. But the highest order of devotional service is represented in Srimati Radharani, even in Damdarastikam prayer, where Krishna is being chased by, by Mother Yashoda with a stick. 
This is a mention of Srimati Radharani. The Lord is therefore saying, my worship is shown by me. I, as my finest potency, worship myself. Iti matva bhajante mam. Understanding this conception, the devotee will come to worship me always under the direction of my best worshipper. And who is that? My finest potency and representation, Srimati Radharani. Or Gurudev. So the Guru is the representative of not only Krishna, he's the representative of Srimati Radharani, who ultimately brings the souls to Krishna. And she's the one who trains the souls ultimately to get the benefit of Lord Krishna's lotus feet. Crossing her, ignoring Srimati Radharani, the highest and most desirable form of service to me is not possible, Krishna says. Radha Dasyam, Gopi Bharta Kamalayur, Das Anudas Anudas. So it all boils down to personal. Everything boils down. We cannot ignore this. We shouldn't ignore this. Why would we want to? Krishna Prabhupada is saying here, Unfortunately, the impersonalist, who has no relation to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, sometimes tries to interpret Srimad Bhagavatam by his poor fund of knowledge. His poor fund of knowledge means that he doesn't accept these facts. He doesn't accept the fact that ultimately we are aspiring Gopi Bharta Kamala Yor Das Anu Das Anu Das. No, he wants to become one. He wants to go beyond Krishna. And, 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 and then just put himself in the same position as Krishna. Um, Prabhupada is saying here, this is a poor fund of knowledge. He sometimes tries to interpret Srimad Bhagavatam by his poor fund of knowledge in grammar and dry speculation. So we're not interested in dry speculation. We are attracted to the likes of the Leela of the Dhamma which we are honoring this month. We're attracted to the pastimes of the cowherd boys. We're attracted to the pastimes of Srimati Radharani with Krishna. It may be the deepest and the highest form of the absolute truth, but there is an attraction there. And it's not that, some, uh, that we should ignore that attraction and just say, oh no, that's too much for me. No, it's not. We are coming in the line of Mahaprabhu, Srimati Radharani. The servitorship of Srimati Radharani is certainly indicated. Only those who are blessed with divine intelligence will be able to appreciate this are not persons with self-acquired intelligence from this Maya quarter, the world of misconception. And this verse talking about the um, talking about the, the Bhagavatam verse from the 11th canto, the word Buddha refers to Summa Dashaha, as described in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.5.32. Persons of fine theistic intelligence arising from direct connection with the transcendental plane, the inner guidance and devotees, Love, anuraga, love and attraction, which is affinity, not by strictly following scriptural rules. We don't get the love of Godhead by strictly following scriptural rules or drawn from any plane of loss or gain, but from bhav, inner divine inspiration. Devotion of this high type is completely and totally without any calculation, as described by, Shri, by Rupa Goswami. I've been reading up about this in the last few days. That's why I've been getting into it since we started this chapter shloka and I've been looking for all the different interpretations of all the different acharyas and it's it's amazing they all lead to the same point they all have their own interpretation they all have their own idea but they all ultimately lead to the same point the highest devotion pleases the transcendental desires of Lord Krishna and is free from the external coverings of any pursuits based on action or knowledge that's a quote from from Bhakti Rasa Rita Sindhu. And, and, and this is a fact. The most rare and elevated stage of devotion is in the line of spontaneous devotion. Sp yes, of course we need the scripture. Of course we need the Bhagavad Gita. We need Srimad Bhagavatam. Where we, we need that we, we can't live without Srila Prabhupada's purports. But ultimately, this is these, all these books, all these shlokas, all this reading, they bring us to the point of spontaneous devotion. This is where, this is where the real nectar is. This is known as Ragamark. And in that line, guided by the qualified guru, as we are, 
guided by Srila Prabhupada, an elevated pure devotee may gradually come to the render service to the leader of one of the groups of Krishna's personal associates who served the Lord in his pastimes in friendship, parenthood, or, con or consorthood. In Vrindavan, the Lord is being served in spontaneous devotion by his friends such as Shubala Shaka and by his parents, Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda. It depends on your mood. It depends on what you're attracted to. Krishna is all attractive. Yes, that's a fact. But Krishna is all attractive in so many different ways, depending on, on, on where our mood is. And that mood can be developed. It can be churned. It can be brought out by the mercy of the Guru. But amongst all his associates, amongst all of Krishna's associates, and amongst all the gopis, the highest order of divine loving service is rendered to the Lord by Srimati Radharani. This is Rupa Goswami speaking. Therefore, the Akma or the Ragamarg is to render service unto Radharani. This is the highest goal of the Rupanuga Gaudiya Sampradaya, the followers of pure devotion as taught by Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada in the line of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is the thing. This is our birthright. This is where we are coming from. And then you, you, we could go into like... Um, um, Prabhupada is quoting here, it's later on in the shloka, I'm not going to uh, go that far, but Prabhupada is quoting here in the shloka uh, 1010, one of my favorite verses, Tesham Satata Yuktana. To those devoted who are constantly dedicated to serving me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So the second part of that, the first part rather, it may seem redundant. Why, uh, uh, we've discussed this before. Why would you need uh, to be given understanding by which you can come to Krishna if you're already there serving him with love, constantly dedicated to serve me with love and dedicated completely and totally serving to me. I give the understanding, the internal divine inspiration by which they can approach me and render various intimate services to me. So the Lord says, the highest group are my servitors, whose sentiment was described in the previous words. By the word Ramanti, those who are constantly engaged in Satata Yuktanam, in my service in consort hood Madhurya Ras with heartfelt love. Then he says he will give them further inspiration or inner instruction by which they can come to him. Yenamam Upayanti Te. When already in this and, pre, and, and the previous verse, the devotee service to the Lord has been described as eternal by the words Nityam and Satata Yukta. Lord Krishna's statement that he will give them further inspiration by which they can come to him, well, it appears to be redundant, doesn't it? Therefore, in the expression, maam upayanti te, they will come to me, the word upayanti must be defined as parakiya bhavena, upapati. Pati means husband, and upapati means paramur. So for those who have already come into divine relationship with me, I give them the special inspiration to come to me as a paramour. In Vrindavan, Lord Krishna is not considered a lawful husband, as we all know, but he's the Lord of the heart, transcendental to even the husband. Deceiving their husbands, as we all read in Krishna book, deceiving their husbands, the gopis of Vrindavan unite with Krishna. They do not allow a second party to come between them and Krishna. And we all know the story when Krishna had a headache and he sent, he sent uh, the cowherd boys to the Brahmins to get the dust from their lotus feet so as he could be cured of his headache. The Brahmins said, no, this is sinful. How can we give our, the dust from our feet to Krishna? So the, the, they went back and they told Krishna, they're refusing. And Krishna said, go to the gopis. Went to the gopis. We went, Krishna is wanting the dust from your feet because he has a headache. And uh, the gopis said, well, if we, get, if we give the dust from our Lord's feet to, uh, to Krishna, we'll go to hell. But who cares? Krishna wants the dust from our Lord's feet. We, go, we give. They don't care. Their only, their only mood the only, uh, the only thing they're thinking of is to serve Krishna. And that is, that is the mood in which we can develop. By, we, we don't want to deceive anybody. But we don't want to allow a second part to become ourselves and Krishna come between. 
We cannot allow even the interception of even scriptural regulation and social law because Krishna's position is absolute. Such a relationship is more relishable to him. Krishna doesn't care whether you're observing uh, social law or observing social convention or whatever the case may be. Krishna is interested. Sarva Dharman Parijaja Mami Kam Shananambaja. What does that mean? There was no other religions at the time when Krishna spoke that verse. There was no Christianity. There was no Islam. There was no Buddhism. There was no Judaism. There was no this ism or that ism or any other ism. So what does Krishna mean? Give up all varieties of religion. This is the, the social convention that is accepted to be the, 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 the convention of what is interpreted to be religion. But Krishna says, no, give up everything. Just surrender unto me. I will give you protection. So this is something that we should embrace. Embrace wholeheartedly. So there's no need for any other interpretation or any other speculation. As Prabhupada constantly says in here, in this purport, the impersonalist who has no relation to the Supreme Personality of Godhead sometimes tries to interpret Srimad Bhagavatam by his poor fund of knowledge. So we are we are also, you know, to some extent, uh, as I discovered, I, I couldn't understand when I was reading in the early days, what does Prabhupada mean about this Mayavadis and impersonalists and, and this and that, and he was always smashing them. I was the impersonalist. I was the one he was talking to because I myself, I couldn't understand that I was coming from that background because I've been influenced to such a strong degree by my own religious background that I could, I, I could only see God in this kind of impersonal voidist, uh, pie in the sky, old man with a beard sitting on the cloud kind of thing. But we all have, the, we all have our own interpretation of who God is, but there's no need for any interpretation. We just accept God as a person. And then we, we worship God in a mood in which we want to relate to him. And, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should just go forward and embrace it wholeheartedly. The impersonal has no relationship to the Supreme Personality Godhead. Sometimes tries to interpret by his poor fund of knowledge. But should never be misled by the conclusion of the so-called grammarians or by other men with a poor fund of knowledge. The so-called grammarians, that applies to those who know the scripture. They know every single word, they know every single interpretation, they know every single vowel, every single consonant, every single dot and every cross on the T. They know everything. And they can quote scripture to left, right and center, but they have no idea of God as a person. And if, and if we're, if we're if we're touched with that kind of impersonal feeling, then we have to get rid of it. We have to root it out and throw it away and just embrace Krishna and embrace the, the, the love and the devotion that is there unlimitedly. No one should try to give a new interpretation by dint of mundane knowledge. And the first step, therefore, in pursuance of the system of knowledge received by Brahma is to approach a bona fide guru who is the representative of the Lord following the parampara system. So we don't want to become attached to any, uh, any interpretation that we may have. And uh, if we see in the, uh, if you will allow, please, uh, if we see in 434, Prabhupada is saying, the path of spiritual realization is undoubtedly difficult. The Lord therefore advises us to approach a bona fide spiritual master in the line of the six disciplic succession from the Lord himself. No one can be a bona fide spiritual master without following this principle of disciplic succession. The Lord is the original spiritual master and a person in disciplic succession can convey the message of the Lord as it is to his disciple. No one can be spiritually realized by manufacturing his own process. So this is what this, this is what Lord Krishna is, uh, is telling Brahmaji here in, the, in this verses. Just follow this conclusion by fixed concentration of the mind and no pride will disturb you. Pride is the enemy of devotion. The Bhagavatam says, Dhamam Tashakchat Bhagavat Pranitam, the path of religion is directly enunciated by the Lord. Therefore, mental speculation or dry arguments cannot help lead one to the right path. So now we're getting into the real crux, the real mission of Srila Prabhupada. What is, what, is, what, is, what is this 
this mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that we all should be embracing. One has to approach a bona fide spiritual master to receive the knowledge. Such a spiritual master should be accepted in full surrender. Who wants to surrender fully? And one should serve the spiritual master like a menial servant without false prestige. Satisfaction of the self-realized spiritual master is the secret of advancement. Inquiries and submission constitute the proper combination for spiritual understanding. Unless there is submission and service, inquiries from the learned spiritual master will not be effective. One must be able to pass the test of the spiritual master. And we all know we have all had tests. And to what extent have we embraced that test and come through? You come through with smelling of roses. Uh, if we actually embrace, we've all gone through so many emotional upsets and upheavals in our life, in our devotional life, as well as in material life, that is, that is normal. These are all tests from the Guru. These are all tests from the spiritual master. And the, and the spiritual master is the personification, the representative of Krishna. Unless there is submission and service, inquiries from the learned spiritual master will not be effective. In this verse, both blind following and absurd inquiries are condemned. So we shouldn't be asking silly questions. Neither should we be blind followers. But we should ask questions in such a way that we can churn this ocean of devotion which is available to all of us. Nobody is left out. Not only should one hear submissively from the spiritual master, one must also get a clear understanding from him in submission and service and inquiries. A bona fide spiritual master is by nature very kind toward the disciple. Therefore, when the student is submissive and is always ready to render service, the reciprocation of knowledge and inquiries becomes perfect. So, we're not interested in social convention. We're not interested in what the society thinks, as Prabhupada used to say in so many purports, we're not interested in vox populi. We don't need to be voted in to become a devotee. No, you just follow your heart. You follow your heart and you follow your heart in such a way that it's guided by, by Shastra, it's guided by scripture, it's guided by the Guru, and it's guided by the association of the, of, the, of the devotees. Krishna says, my relationship with them, this is from Brindav and Bhajan, uh, my relationship with them is independent of everything conceivable across this law, society, scripture, everything. It is most innate and natural, does not require any social or scriptural sanction. I say to my devotees, you may show formal respect to all of these restrictions and live in the society, but from the heart of your heart, you are mine. This is the special inspiration and insight I give to those devotees. Yena mam upayanti te. Externally, yes, it's a fact, we live in the material world. We live in the world of social, social convention. There are social and scriptural demands, but my position is over and above them. Veda is my instruction for the benefit of the masses who have deviated from me, and the society is also under the jurisdiction of these general instructions given to the public by me. But my divine relationship with everything is intrinsic and independent. So we, are, we, we, we cannot forget that. We are sat, chit, anand. This is our position. Everything else is secondary. It does not require recognition from anyone. How can we, how can we need recognition? We are sat chit and and. Why does somebody else need to come along and, and rubber stamp that idea in, in an official capacity? This is a fact. Such a relationship is the highest. It is constant. It supersedes all laws and society which are guided by the Vedas. Rather, all the Vedas are searching for such a thing. So, the Vedas personified is bowing down and surrendering to Krishna. The Vedas personified is pointing us in the direction in which we should be going. But not only a direction, but where, how, we don't know. Only in the direction in which we should be going can be pointed out by the Guru. Anywhere and everywhere, everything belongs to Krishna. For one who knows this, all possibilities of sensual pleasure and exploitation are uprooted. And there may be some weeds that are growing here and there. We should just be very careful to uproot those weeds 
and make sure that they don't grow and they don't become more prominent. For example, an unmarried woman may have the possibility of being approached by many, but there is less possibility for those who are married because they are possessed by someone. Similarly, when we are able to know that everything is only for the satisfaction of Krishna, then we shall realize that all our exploiting tendencies have vanished forever. Everything belongs to Krishna. So we think that we possess this, we possess that, we possess the other. The husband possesses the wife, the wife possesses the husband, the son, the daughter, the, whatever the case may be, the mother, the father. No, nothing will remain to be utilized for the pleasure of our sensual experience. It will be very deeply felt in our hearts. Everything has its existence only for the satisfaction of Krishna. This sounds like a, a big leap of faith, like you're ready to jump off a cliff and uh, Krishna is going to catch you. That's, it's quite a leap of faith, but that is the actual reality. There is no room for any other exploitation. We are also included there. Our existence is also only for his satisfaction. Everything is meant for his divine Leela. There is no possibility for any other pastimes. And if we think there is, if we hold on to that thread of, you know, dedication to the material atmosphere, then that's the direction in which our, our desire is going to take us. He's the owner and his ownership is absolute. So, Sarva Dharman Parijaja, do we accept that or do we not? The scripture, society and law designate, this is yours, that is another's, that belongs to a third party, whatever the case may be. We know the whole case of, you know, the whole, the whole society has its own rules and regulations and formulas and everything. And what is the end result of all their rules and regulations and formulas and courts and so-called justice and judicial system? It's a mess. There's no such thing as justice. Justice, as it says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the eleventh canto, it says in Kali Yuga, justice will come. Justice will come out of a checkbook. So that's exactly what we're witnessing. It's nothing to do with Africa or whatever the third world. It's all over. It's everywhere. If somebody has a a, a very strong political influence, that influences the courts, whether we like it or not. So there's this this idea of you know that uh, you know. The, the justice or the law will, will, will guide our, our life. It's all nonsense. All others, possessor, property, master, servant, are all relative and only sanctioned by him for the time being. So we have these designations, but they're sanctioned by Krishna only for now. And if we understand that, one who understands the, the eternal nature of my appearance and disappearance, he is sure to reach the absolute goal. The absolute owner, possessor and enjoyer is Krishna alone, nobody else. When we arrive at such a conclusion, not like the Mayavadis, then only then is complete purification of our hearts possible. Everyone is thinking of themselves as the master of this or the master of that or the owner of this or the owner of that. But this is all heart disease. This is all conceived in a diseased state of consciousness. In a healthy state, when the heart is quite wholesome, we can see the supreme whole and we can see that everything is meant only for his satisfaction. So we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for that? Is this really what we want? And if it is, and we reach that actual conclusion, then we may be stumbling on the way, we may be faltering in so many ways, but if that is the conclusion in our heart, and that is really what we want, then stumbling or not stumbling, we will ultimately attain that destination. We just have to reach the stage where we actually put it into practice on a daily basis. Krishna says, out of compassion for them, I, situated within their hearts, dispel the darkness of ignorance, with the torchlight of knowledge. So, sitting in their hearts. And again, if we appreciate pure, non-calculative devotion, jnana sunya bhakti, the Lord's statement here may again appear redundant and inconsistent when those high devotees are already admitted to be performing continuous and elevated service, why do they need to be given more? Because you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. 
So the Lord, he says, <clears throat> for them, to favor them, I dispel their darkness. From me comes knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. We don't need anything else. We don't, know, we don't need any other interpretation. We just simply need to surrender to Krishna, to the lotus feet of Krishna. If, if a prophet says in the verse, no one should give a new interpretation by dint of mundane knowledge. At the first step, therefore, in pursuance of the system of knowledge received by Brahma, is to approach a bona fide guru who is the representative of the Lord following the Parampara system. No one should try to squeeze out his own meaning by imperfect mundane knowledge. The guru or the bona fide spiritual master is competent to teach the disciple in the right path with reference to the context of all authentic Vedic literature. This is an important point. We have to see the context. We can't just quote a shloka and quote this and quote that and quote the other. We have to see what is the context? What is the reason why Krishna is saying this? What is the reason why the Guru is saying this? What is the reason why the, why the, the Lord Chaitanya is performing in a particular way? When we see the context through the mercy of the Guru, everything falls into place. He does not attempt to juggle words to bewilder the student. The bona fide spiritual master, by his personal activities, teaches the disciple the principles of devotional service. Without personal service, one would go on speculating, like the impersonalists and dry speculators, life after life, and would be unable to reach the final conclusion. So we don't need any speculation. It comes around to that point again and again and again. It cannot be emphasized enough. Devotional service. This is what we need. If we get into the mood of devotional service, everything falls into place. So, this knowledge is extraordinary. But it is extraordinary in what sense? You have to say, lamentation and delusion are generally known to be the symptoms of the mode of ignorance. The elevated devotee who takes to Krishna, not as the Supreme God, but as a friend, son, husband or lover, will come to experience lamentation and delusion in the same way. But this is only an outward appearance of ignorance. In fact, it is the pain of divine separation. They're just lamenting, just like Lord Chaitanya is lamenting. Lord Chaitanya is expressing his service to Krishna in a mood of vipralamba. So we are also serving in a mood of vipralamba. We're separated. And when, they, when we're separated from the lover, the lover and the beloved, they're always thinking of each other. They, they're, they're, one is on the other side of the globe, on the, in another country, in another town, in another village. They're only thinking about each other constantly. So in this mood of separation, then we become deeper and closer and closer and closer to the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. So the Lord says, fortunately for them, to favor them, I dispel their darkness. But it can also be interpreted in another way, where Krishna can say, I want their favor. So it works both ways. This relationship with Krishna is a two-way two -way street. It's not a one-way thing. The Lord says, I aspire for the favor of those devotees of the highest order. So what, 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 what mood is, uh, is Lord Chaitanya appearing in? He's appearing in the mood of Srimadhu Radharani, who's crazy about Krishna. So he, and he is crazy also, but he wants to imbibe that mood. And he's appearing in the mood of a devotee to give us the idea of how we can actually practice our devotional creeper. So we shouldn't be afraid of these things. We shouldn't be afraid to embrace this knowledge. We shouldn't be afraid to embrace this mood. And we should just dive in and become completely and totally dedicated to the lotus feet of the Lord. So I think um, I may have spoken a bit too much. So please, if there are any questions or comments, I'd be very happy to 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 take them now. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hello. <coughs> Can anybody hear me? Yes. I'm just waiting for Bhakta Mugur to unmute so that we can hear him. Oh, Jai. Haribo. 
Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Professor uh, Kamataji, for that. And thank you so much, uh, Prabhuji, uh, for that uh, great talk uh, on 2937. Please accept all humble blessings and all glories to Srila Prabhupada. So Jai. this information in order to understand. Jai. Jai. Uh, I don't know if uh, Professor Kirti Kamataji has a comment on. Yes, yes, Prabhuji, thank you for this excellent session today. Um, I wanted to reflect back on your first comment that all the places, all the dams are, um, are uh, controlled by the Shaivites or the Shankrites. Uh, kindly um, uh, give an example. I didn't understand that. And my second question is for the previous verses where in the previous verse, it was said that a pure devotee refuses to accept all five different types of liberation. I just needed to know what the five different types of liberations are, Prabhuji, if you can. Well, I the five you... types of liberation I can't recall from my head, but I can speak about liberation in general. Like um, Prabhupada gives the example, um, I forget where, it's just like when, when if you're if you're in a prison house, and you're liberated from the prison and your sentence is up and they open the door and you go outside the prison house, then you're, you're liberated. But then what? So what do you do after your liberation? You have to you have to do something, you have to engage. So the so liberation moksha is not really the goal of the devotee. As for the uh, as for the Shankarites, um, your question was in relationship to what exactly? All the all the, the main tirtas like Dwarka and uh, all the uh, Prayak, all these very, very famous places, they're all controlled by the Shankarites. They're 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 the main they're the main people, they're mainly in charge. It's only very recently that because of Prabhupada's preaching that the, the Shankarites are beginning to now uh, come around and uh, they're beginning to come around and embrace the personalist aspect of the absolute truth. But let's face it, all the all the all the Shankar uh, Shankarite acharyas they're in charge of all the main the main tirtas in India. What was your question in relationship to that exactly? So, uh, so I probably did not understand the meaning of Shankarites, but now that you have uh, thrown oh, some light on it. I have now yeah. understood that Shankrites are those people, and correct me if I'm wrong, are those yes. people who do not take the Lord in the personal form. Uh, yes. They do all the worship and they do everything, but they still do not consider Lord personal. They they what? read the they, they read the Srimad Bhagavatam, they read the Bhagavad Gita, they follow the scriptures the same way as we do. They they have the Ekadanda. And Prabhupada said, um, you know, if we meet uh, uh, an impersonalist Mayavadi Sanyasi, we should offer respect to those. And we have had so many um, Mayavadi Sanyasis invited by the Hindu community during the time when I've been in Kenya. And uh, I've always gone to their talks, to their discussions, to hear what they had to say, because I was representing the temple. I was always invited by the, the Hindu chairman of the temples, the various temples where I lived and served. Mombasa and Kasumu and Nairobi to come to these different programs. I always went along and the, the, I always treated them with respect, paid the, paid dandavats, everything like that. But their interpretation, just like um, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he had so many arguments with the Mayavadi sannyasis. Many of them converted. Many of them came over. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, he eventually converted. He he gave a recitation of the, the Bhagavad Sapta, as we do. As we hear, most of the Bhagavad Sapta uh, reciters that we invite, uh, who come to uh, not us, but I mean the Hindu community when they invite, they're coming from the Shankaracharya school of thought. And uh, Sarva Boma, he recited the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam for seven days. Lord Chaitanya didn't say a word. And at the end, uh, Sarva Boma said, But you, you, I've been reciting this now for seven days, you haven't given a single word. You, you don't understand the interpretation and the Lord Jatin said, well, I understand the verses very well, but the interpretation is completely bewildering to me. It doesn't make any sense. So then Sarvabhan said, well, you explain. 
And after he explained, the servant woman immediately realized, wow, yeah, this is it. This is the real deal. So when he when he joined Lord Chaitanya, thousands, millions of his followers joined with him. So then Lord Chaitanya, everywhere he went, he would defeat the but these Shankar Shankarites, they're they're in charge of the main Tirtas all over India. And they're they're the they're the ones who call the shots. So we have um and for the most part, we have to say um, they're they're the ones who give the, uh, the 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 interpretation of the scripture to most of the Hindu population, so that that was Prabhupada's big uh, big mission, Nirvishesha Sunyavadi, to uh, to eliminate all this voidism and impersonalism. That was his mission in the world, not only in the West. I mean, we were the we were the biggest impersonalists, much bigger than anybody in India. Those of us coming from the West. Especially from the Abrahamic religions, we had no idea about God. But Prabhupada came to change that, and he changed it in so many different ways. So as for the five, uh, the five um, different kinds of liberation, I can't recall what they are. Maybe you can, maybe you can remind me, please, and maybe we can discuss it on another evening, and uh, we can, I can get into that and look it up, and can maybe give you an answer another day. That's fine, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Over Thank to you, Bhakta Mugo. We've exhausted our time, so we can finish up now. Hare Krishna, can I ask a question? Please. Sure. Hare Bol. Prabhu, um, you, you know, I find it so difficult to, to, to uh, take to Krishna's lotus feet or mm. say surrender to Krishna because I feel that I'm not worthy of it. And I've been struggling with this, but I keep going, I keep going, and I'm doing service, and I'm doing this and that, and this the faith is there, but I don't see, I feel so embarrassed to, <laughs> I know it sounds awful, but, you know, I don't think I'm worthy of Krishna. Welcome and I, to I, I struggle, I struggle to get, you know, to, to surrender, I don't know how you surrender, how, how it can happen, because that's my biggest struggle. Yes, yes. I wish I wish I could give an answer for that, because I think, uh, for the most part, we're all in the same boat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, we're all in the same boat. It does take an effort. And ultimately, <laughs> um, you know, Prabhupada used to quote that English phrase, man proposes, God disposes. Yeah. So we can make we can make the proposal to Krishna, please. As as Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he's written it so so appropriately. When or when will that day be mine? My offenses ceasing, taste for the name increasing. When or oh, when will your mercy shine? When or oh, when will that day be none be mine? Who could you could you could even for a second think? that Bhaktivinoda Thakur wasn't on the highest platform of love of God. But he's putting himself in the position of our fallen position. And he's putting himself in that position. Please beg for the mercy. He's just begging for the mercy of Krishna. That's all we, that's all we can do. Yes, yes. I've been, you know, I've been struggling with that one for many, many years. I'm going through all the emotions of when, Krishna, when am I going to get this taste, this sada ruchi which it just doesn't seem to come but we can just beg we can just keep in the forlorn hope that eventually it will come but bhaktivinoda thakur he says again whatever is holding us back from diving into this nectar of divinity which is really the absolute truth for which we're as lord chaitanya says for which we're always hankering what is holding us back Unfortunately, certainly in my case, offenses to the holy names. The ten offenses, you know, this is the main one. Yeah. The, main, the main thing is uh, inattentive chanting. And yes, we can only beg that we can, you know, one day we can get a glimpse. It comes occasionally. We get a taste. Say, wow, that was a lovely kirtan. That was a, that was a lovely class. That was, we, get a, we get a glimpse. And some realization dawns on us, but it, it, it happens so rarely. And that is the main thing. The main thing is to avoid the offenses, but to continue regardless. 
whatever the case may be, or regardless of whatever the world is going to throw at us or our mind is going to throw at us, we stick with the we stick with the process of sadhana bhakti. It will come eventually. Yeah, I I do get the taste as you say. They they're sort of um sort of fleeting ones, but yes. I enjoy I enjoy what Krishna gave us and it, and so maybe that's what it is. That might be yes. the nectar. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. We all have our own individual needs, and we all have our own individual desires. It's a question of dovetailing those needs and dovetailing those desires in the service of the Lord. Ultimately, that's where it's where it's really at. Thank you very much. Harry Bowl. Thank you, Prabhu. Very kind. Thank to, you. To, to, so, so tolerant and patient to explain it all. Thank you. Sorry. Anyone else? Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Um, thank you for your discourse. I know you've gone over time. But on this question of liberation, mm -hmm. I asked this question once in uh, mm -hmm. the discourse, and I was told that um, when one becomes liberated, that person has gone beyond the modes of nature, has surpassed these three modes of nature, and... Um, because I've heard and read quite a few, quite a lot of devotees at present are liberated. So I wanted to know exactly what does it mean when one becomes liberated. So I'm still uh, not clear on that <laughs> point. Yes, that's a very nice question. Well, Prabhupada describes liberation as somebody who has no material tinge whatsoever. There's not even the slightest tinge of materialism. And it's from that point, it's from that very point, when there's no tinge of material desires, everything is gone. It's from that point that we can begin devotional service. Otherwise, we're just in the practicing stage. Yes. We're going on the altar, we're doing our puja, we're offering a flower to the deity, we're cooking for Krishna, but there is a tinge of, of materialism still there. But when we get past that, then that service becomes pure, unmotivated and uninterrupted. There's, there's no interruption, there's no, there's no motivation, there's no, uh, oh yeah, if I give this flower to Krishna, then I'll get something back or I'll cook this for Krishna, then I'll get to taste the prasadam. No, we just completely and totally unmotivated, uninterrupted. So liberation is at the stage where our devotional creeper begins from that point in time. And we recognize the devotional creeper for what it is. And it just, it just deepens from there. Well, thank but you. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more? Yeah, thank you so much, Prabhuji. Wow. Uh, that was, and then, then, thank you so much for those beautiful questions. Those, they add so much to our bhakti. Yeah, maybe I can, I can kindly ask uh, Pramila Mataji to end the session for us today. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Prabhuji. We always look forward to listening to your discourses. You explain. I am sure Prabhupada hears of your love for him, the great love you, the way you describe him, so beautiful in all your discourses. May he bless you and let you, you through the front door rather than the back door. So thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> and uh, thank you. if we could all unmute and say the Hare Krishna mantra in glorification of Vidura Prabhuji, please. Hare Krishna, 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 Krishna,
All glory to Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Hari Bol. Thank you very much, Dennis Prabhu, to uh, host this session today. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.